A Journey into the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne Chapter 1 The Professor and His Family On the 24th of May, 1863, my uncle, Professor Liedenbrock, rushed into his little house, number 19 Konigstrasse, one of the oldest streets in the oldest portion of the city of Hamburg. Martha must have concluded that she was very much behind hand, for the dinner had only just been put into the oven. Well now, said I to myself, if that most impatient of men is hungry, what a disturbance he will make. Am Liedenbrock so soon, cried poor Martha in great alarm, half opening the dining room door. Yes, Martha, but very likely the dinner is not half cooked, for it is not two yet. St. Michael's clock has only just struck half past one. Then why has the master come home so soon? Perhaps he will tell us that himself. Here he is, Monsieur Axel. I will run and hide myself while you argue with him. And Martha retreated in safety into her own dominions. I was left alone. But how was it possible for a man of my undecided turn of mind to argue successfully with so irascible a person as the professor? With this persuasion I was hurrying away to my own little retreat upstairs when the street door creaked upon its hinges. Heavy feet made the whole flight of stairs to shake, and the master of the house, passing rapidly through the dining room, threw himself in haste into his own sanctum. But on his rapid way he had found time to fling his hazel stick into a corner, his rough broad brim upon the table, and these few emphatic words at his nephew, Axel, follow me! I had scarcely had time to move when the professor was again shouting after me, What? Not come yet? And I rushed into my redoubtable master's study. Otto Liedenbrock had no mischief in him, I willingly allow that. But unless he very considerably changes as he grows older, at the end he will be a most original character. He was a professor at the Ohanim, and was delivering a series of lectures on mineralogy, in the course of every one of which he broke into a passion once or twice at least. Not at all that he was over-anxious about the improvement of his class, or about the degree of attention with which they listened to him, or the success which might eventually crown his labors. Such little matters of detail never troubled him much. His teaching was, as the German philosophy calls it, subjective. It was to benefit himself, not others. He was a learned egotist. He was a well of science, and the pulleys worked uneasily when you wanted to draw anything out of it. In a word, he was a learned miser. Germany has not a few professors of this sort. To his misfortune, my uncle was not gifted with the sufficiently rapid utterance, not to be sure when he was talking at home, but certainly in his public delivery. This is a want much to be deplored in a speaker. The fact is that during the course of his lectures at the Johannum, the professor often came to a complete standstill. He fought with willful words that refused to pass his struggling lips, such words as resist and distend the cheeks, and at last break out into the unasked-for shape of a round and most unscientific oath. Then his fury would gradually abate. Now, in mineralogy, there are many half-Greek and half-Latin terms, very hard to articulate, and which would be most trying to a poet's measures. I don't wish to say a word against so respectable a science, far be that from me. True, in the august presence of rhombohedral crystals, retinasphaltic resins, galenites, fasciites, molybdenites, tongue states of manganese, and tight night of zirconium, why, <laughs> the most facile of tongues may make a slip now and then. It therefore happened that this venial fault of my uncle's came to be pretty well understood in time, and an unfair advantage was taken of it. The students laid wait for him in dangerous places, and when he began to stumble, loud was the laughter, which is not in good taste, not even in Germans. And if there was always a full audience to honor the Liedenbrock courses, I should be sorry to conjecture how many came to make merry at my uncle's expense. Nevertheless, my good uncle was a man of deep learning, a fact I am most anxious to assert and reassert. 
Sometimes he might irretrievably injure a specimen by his too great ardor in handling it, but still he united the genius of a true geologist with the keen eye of the mineralogist. Armed with his hammer, his steel pointer, his magnetic needles, his blowpipe, and his bottle of nitric acid, he was a powerful man of science. He would refer any mineral to its proper place among the 600 elementary substances now enumerated by its fracture, its appearance, its hardness, its fusibility, its sonorousness, its smell, and its taste. The name of Liedenbrock was honorably mentioned in colleges and learned societies. Humphrey Davy, Humboldt, Captain Sir John Franklin, General Sabine, never failed to call upon him on their way through Hamburg. Becquerel, Ebelman, Brewster, Dumas, Milne Edwards, St. Clair de Ville frequently consulted him upon the most difficult problems in chemistry, a science which was indebted to him for considerable discoveries, for in 1853 there had appeared at Leipzig an imposing folio by Otto Liedenbrock entitled A Treatise Upon Transcendental Chemistry, with plates, a work, however, which failed to cover its expenses. To all these titles to honor, let me add that my uncle was the curator of the Museum of Mineralogy formed by M. Struve, the Russian ambassador, a most valuable collection, the fame of which is European. Such was the gentleman who addressed me in that impetuous manner. Fancy a tall spare man, of an iron constitution, and with a fair complexion which took off a good ten years from the fifty he must own to. His restless eyes were in incessant motion behind his full-size spectacles. His long, thin nose was like a knife-blade, Boys had been heard to remark that that organ was magnetized and attracted iron filings, but this was merely a mischievous report. It had no attraction except for snuff, which it seemed to draw to itself in great quantities. When I have added, to complete my portrait, that my uncle walked by mathematical strides of a yard and a half, and that in walking he kept his fists firmly closed, a sure sign of an irritable temperament, I think I shall have said enough to disenchant any one who should by mistake have coveted much of his company. He lived in his own little house in Konigstrasse, a structure half brick and half wood, with a gable cut into steps. It looked upon one of those winding canals which intersect each other in the middle of the ancient quarter of Hamburg and which the great fire of 1842 had fortunately spared. It is true that the old house stood slightly off the perpendicular, and bulged out a little towards the street. Its roof sloped a little to one side, like the cap over the left ear of a Tugendbund student. Its lines wanted accuracy, but, after all, it stood firm, thanks to an old elm which buttressed it in the front, and which often in spring sent its young sprays through the window panes. My uncle was tolerably well off for a German professor. The house was his own and everything in it. The living contents were his goddaughter Grauben, a young Verlandice of seventeen, Martha, and myself. As his nephew and an orphan, I became his laboratory assistant. I freely confess that I was exceedingly fond of geology and all its kindred sciences. The blood of a mineralogist was in my veins, and in the midst of my specimens I was always happy. In a word, a man might live happily enough in the little old house in the Konigstrasse, in spite of the restless impatience of its master, for although he was a little too excitable, he was very fond of me. But the man had no notion how to wait, Nature herself was too slow for him. In April, after he had planted in the terracotta pots outside his window seedling plants of mignonette and convolvulus, he would go and give them a little pull by their leaves to make them grow faster. <laughs> in dealing with such a strange individual, there was nothing for it but prompt obedience. I therefore rushed after him. Chapter 2 a mystery to be solved at any price. That study of his was a museum, and nothing else. 
Specimens of everything known in mineralogy lay there in their places in perfect order and correctly named, divided into inflammable, metallic, and lithoid minerals. How well I knew all these bits of science. Many a time, instead of enjoying the company of lads of my own age, I had preferred dusting these graphites, anthracites, coals, lignites, and peats, and there were bitumens, resins, organic salts to be protected from the least grain of dust, and metals from iron to gold, metals whose current value altogether disappeared in the presence of the republican equality of scientific specimens, and stones, too, enough to rebuild entirely the house in Konigstrasse, even with a handsome additional room, which would have suited me admirably. But on entering this study now, I thought of none of these wonders. My uncle alone filled my thoughts. He had thrown himself into a velvet easy chair, and was grasping between his hands a book over which he bent, pondering with intense admiration. "'Here's a remarkable book! What a wonderful book!' he was exclaiming. These ejaculations brought to my mind the fact that my uncle was liable to occasional fits of bibliomania, but no old book had any value in his eyes unless it had the virtue of being nowhere else to be found, or, at any rate, of being illegible. "'Well, now, don't you see it yet? Why, I have got a priceless treasure that I found this morning in rummaging an old Hervelius's shop, the Jew.' Magnificent, I replied, with a good imitation of enthusiasm. What was the good of all this fuss about an old quarto, bound in rough calf, a yellow faded volume, with a ragged seal depending from it? But for all that, there was no lull yet in the admiring exclamations of the professor. See, he went on, both asking the questions and supplying the answers. Isn't it a beauty? Yes, splendid! Did you ever see such a binding? Doesn't the book open easily? Yes, it stops open anywhere. But does it shut equally well? Yes, for the binding and the leaves are flush, all in a straight line, and no gaps or openings anywhere. And look at its back after seven hundred years. Why, Bozerian Claus or Porgold might have been proud of such a binding. While rapidly making these comments, my uncle kept opening and shutting the old tome. I really could do no less than ask a question about its contents, although I did not feel the slightest interest. And what is the title of this marvelous work? I asked with an affected eagerness, which he must have been very blind not to see through. This work, replied my uncle, firing up with renewed enthusiasm, this work is the Heims Kringla of Snor Tölsen, the most famous Icelandic author of the 12th century. It is the chronicle of the Norwegian princes who ruled in Iceland. Indeed, I cried, keeping up wonderfully. Of course it is the German translation. What? sharply replied the professor. A translation? What should I do with a translation? This is the Icelandic original, in the magnificent idiomatic vernacular, which is both rich and simple, and admits of an infinite variety of grammatical combinations and verbal modifications. Like German, I happily ventured. Yes, replied my uncle, shrugging his shoulders. But in addition to all this, the Icelandic has three numbers like the Greek, and irregular declensions of nouns proper like the Latin. Ah, said I, a little moved out of my indifference. And is the type good? Type? What do you mean by talking of type, wretched Axel? Type? Do you take it for a printed book, you ignorant fool? It is a manuscript, a runic manuscript. Runic? Yes. Do you want me to explain what that is? Of course not, I replied in the tone of an injured man. But my uncle persevered and told me, against my will, of many things I cared nothing about. Runic characters were in use in Iceland in former ages. They were invented, it is said, by Odin himself. Look there and wonder, impious young man, 
and admire these letters, the invention of the Scandinavian god. Well, well, not knowing what to say, I was going to prostrate myself before this wonderful book, a way of answering equally pleasing to gods and kings, and which has the advantage of never giving them any embarrassment, when a little incident happened to divert conversation into another channel. This was the appearance of a dirty slip of parchment, which slipped out of the volume and fell upon the floor. My uncle pounced upon this shred with incredible avidity, an old document, enclosed in immemorial time within the folds of this old book, had for him an immeasurable value. What's this? he cried, and he laid out upon the table a piece of parchment, five inches by three, and along which were traced certain mysterious characters. Here is the exact facsimile. I think it important to let these strange signs be publicly known, for they were the means of drawing on Professor Liedenbrock and his nephew to undertake the most wonderful expedition of the nineteenth century. Runic glyphs occur here. The professor mused a few moments over this series of characters, then raising his spectacles he pronounced, These are runic letters. They are exactly like those of the manuscript of Snor Tursen. But what on earth is their meaning? Runic letters appearing to my mind to be an invention of the learned to mystify this poor world, I was not sorry to see my uncle suffering the pangs of mystification. At least so it seemed to me, judging from his fingers, which were beginning to work with terrible energy. It is certainly old Icelandic, he muttered between his teeth, and Professor Liedenbrock must have known, for he was acknowledged to be quite a polyglot. Not that he could speak fluently in the two thousand languages and twelve thousand dialects which are spoken on the earth, but he at least knew his share of them. So he was going, in the presence of this difficulty, to give way to all the impetuosity of his character, and I was preparing for a violent outbreak, when two o'clock struck by the little timepiece over the fireplace. At that moment our good housekeeper Martha opened the study door, saying, Dinner is ready. <sighs> I am afraid he sent that soup to where it would boil away to nothing, and Martha took to her heels for safety. I followed her, and hardly knowing how I got there, I found myself seated in my usual place. I waited a few minutes. No professor came. Never within my remembrance had he missed the important ceremonial of dinner. And yet what a good dinner it was. There was parsley soup, an omelet of ham garnished with spiced sorrel, a fillet of veal with compote of prunes, for dessert crystallized fruit the whole washed down with sweet moselle. All this my uncle was going to sacrifice to a bit of old parchment. As an affectionate and attentive nephew, I considered it my duty to eat for him as well as for myself, which I did conscientiously. I have never known such a thing, said Martha. M. Lidenbrock is not at table. Who could have believed it? I said with my mouth full. "'Something serious is going to happen,' said the servant, shaking her head. "'My opinion was that nothing more serious would happen than an awful scene "'when my uncle should have discovered that his dinner was devoured. "'I had come to the last of the fruit when a very loud voice tore me away from the pleasures of my dessert. "'With one spring I bounded out of the dining room into the study.'" Chapter 3 The Runic Writing Exercises of the Professor Undoubtedly it is runic, said the professor, bending his brows, but there is a secret in it, and I mean to discover the key. A violent gesture finished the sentence. Sit there, he added, holding out his fist towards the table. Sit there und right. I was seated in a trice. Now I will dictate to you every letter of our alphabet which corresponds with each of these Icelandic characters. We will see what that will give us. But, by St. Michael, if you should dare to deceive me... The dictation commenced. I did my best. Every letter was given to me one after the other, with the following remarkable result. 
mm.rnlls e s r e v e l s e e c capital i d e s g t s s m f v n t e i e f n i e d r k e k t comma s a m n a t r a t e capital s s a o d r r n e m t n a e capital i n v a e c t r r i l capital s a capital a t s a a r dot n v c r c i e a a b s c c r m i e e v t capital v l f r capital a n t v d t comma i a c o s e i b o k e d i i capital i when this work was ended, my uncle tore the paper from me and examined it attentively for a long time. What does it all mean? he kept repeating mechanically. Upon my honor, I could not have enlightened him. Besides, he did not ask me, and went on talking to himself. This is what is called a cryptogram, or cipher, he said, in which letters are purposely thrown in confusion which, if properly arranged, would reveal their sense. Only think that under this jargon there may lie concealed the clue to some great discovery. As for me, I was of the opinion that there was nothing at all in it, though, of course, I took care not to say so. Then the professor took the book and the parchment and diligently compared them together. These two writings are not by the same hand, he said, the cipher is of later date than the book, an undoubted proof of which I see in a moment. The first letter is a double M, a letter which is not to be found in Turlson's book, and which was only added to the alphabet in the 14th century. Therefore, there are 200 years between the manuscript and the document. I admitted that this was a strictly logical conclusion, I am therefore led to imagine, continued my uncle, that some possessor of this book wrote these mysterious letters. But who was that possessor? Is his name nowhere to be found in the manuscript? My uncle raised his spectacles, took up a strong lens, and carefully examined the blank pages of the book. On the front of the second, the title page, he noticed a sort of stain which looked like an ink blot. But in looking at it very closely, he thought he could distinguish some half-effaced letters. My uncle at once fastened upon this as the center of interest, and he labored at that blot until, by the help of his microscope, he ended by making out the following runic characters, which he read without difficulty. On Socknusum, he cried in triumph, "Why that is the name of another Icelander, a savant of the sixteenth century." a celebrated alchemist. I gazed at my uncle with satisfactory admiration. Those alchemists, he resumed, Avicenna, Bacon, Lully, Paracelsus, were the real and only savants of their time. They made discoveries at which we are astonished. Has not this Socknesem concealed under his cryptogram some surprising invention? It is so. It must be so. The professor's imagination took fire at this hypothesis. No doubt, I ventured to reply, but what interest would he have in thus hiding so marvelous a discovery? Why? Why? How can I tell? Did not Galileo do the same by Saturn? We shall see. I will get at the secret of this document, and I will neither sleep nor eat until I have found it out. My comment on this was a half-suppressed, Oh, nor you is a axle, he added. The deuce, said I to myself. 
then it is lucky I have eaten two dinners today. First of all, we must find out the key to this cipher. That cannot be difficult. At these words, I quickly raised my head, but my uncle went on soliloquizing. There's nothing easier. In this document, there are a hundred and thirty-two letters. These, seventy-seven consonants and fifty-five vowels. This is the proportion found in southern languages, whilst northern tongues are much richer in consonants. Therefore, this is in a southern language. These were very fair conclusions, I thought. But what language is it? Here I looked for a display of learning, but I met instead with profound analysis. This Soknesem, he went on, was a very well-informed man. Now, since he was not writing in his own mother tongue, he would naturally select that which was currently adopted by the choice spirits of the 16th century. I mean Latin. If I am mistaken, I can but try Spanish, French, Italian, Greek, or Hebrew. But the savants of the 16th century generally wrote in Latin. I am therefore entitled to pronounce this, a priori, to be Latin. It is Latin. Yes, it is Latin, my uncle went on. But it is Latin confused und in disorder, pertubata seo in ordinada, as Euclid has it. Very well, thought I. If you can bring order out of that confusion, my dear uncle, you are a clever man. Let us examine carefully, said he again, taking up the leaf upon which I had written. Here is a series of one hundred and thirty-two letters in apparent disorder. There are words consisting of consonants only, as N-R-R-L-L-S, others, on the other hand, in which vowels predominate, as, for instance, the fifth, U-N-E-E-I-E-F, or the last but one, O-S-E-I-B-O. -E now, this arrangement has evidently not been premeditated. It has arisen mathematically in obedience to the unknown law which has ruled in the succession of these letters. It appears to me a certainty that the original sentence was written in a proper manner, and afterwards distorted by a law which we have yet to discover. Whoever possesses the key of this cipher will read it with fluency. What is that key? Axel, have you got it? I answered not a word, and for a very good reason. My eyes had fallen upon a charming picture suspended against the wall, the portrait of Graubin. My uncle's ward was at that time at Altona, staying with a relation, and in her absence I was very downhearted, for I may confess it to you now, the pretty Verlandes and the professor's nephew loved each other with a patience and a calmness entirely German. We had become engaged unknown to my uncle, who was too much taken up with geology to be able to enter into such feelings as ours. Graubin was a lovely blue-eyed blonde, rather given to gravity and seriousness, but that did not prevent her from loving me very sincerely. As for me, I adored her, if there is such a word in the German language. Thus it happened that the picture of my pretty Verland days threw me in a moment out of the world of realities into that of memory and fancy. There looked down upon me the faithful companion of my labors and my recreations. Every day she helped me to arrange my uncle's precious specimens, she and I labeled them together. Mademoiselle Graubin was an accomplished mineralogist. She could have taught a few things to a savant. She was fond of investigating abstruse scientific questions. What pleasant hours we have spent in study, and how often I envied the very stones which she handled with her charming fingers. Then, when our leisure hours came, we used to go out together and turn into the shady avenues by the Ulster, which went happily side by side up to the old windmill, which formed such an improvement to the landscape at the head of the lake. On the road we chatted hand in hand. I told her amusing tales at which she laughed heartily. Then we reached the banks of the Elba, and after having bid goodbye to the swan, sailing gracefully amidst the white water lilies, we returned to the quay by the steamer.
This is just where I was in my dream, when my uncle with a vehement thump on the table dragged me back to the realities of life. Come, said he, the very first idea which would come into anyone's head to confuse the letters of a sentence would be to write the words vertically instead of horizontally. Indeed, said I. Now we must see what would be the effect of that, Axel. Put down upon this paper any sentence you like, only instead of arranging the letters in the usual way, one after the other, place them in succession in vertical columns, so as to group them together in five or six vertical lines. I caught his meaning, and immediately produced the following literary wonder. I love you well, my own dear Graubin. Exclamation mark. Good said the professor, without reading them. Now set down those words in a horizontal line. I obeyed, and with this result, I-Y-L-O-A-U-L-O-L-W-R-B-O-U-N-G-E-V-W-M-D-R-N-E-E-Y-E-A! exclamation mark. Excellent, said my uncle, taking the paper hastily out of my hands. This begins to look just like an ancient document. The vowels and the consonants are grouped together in equal disorder. There are even capitals in the middle of words, and commas too, just as in Socknusem's parchment. I considered these remarks very clever. Now, said my uncle, looking straight at me, to read the sentence which you have just written, and with which I am wholly unacquainted,
A Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne Chapter 4 The Enemy to be Starved into Submission "'He is gone!' cried Martha, running out of her kitchen at the noise of the violent slamming of doors. "'Yes,' I replied. "'Completely gone.' "'Well, and how about his dinner?' said the old servant. "'He won't have any.' "'And his supper?' "'He won't have any.' "'What?' cried Martha, with clasped hands. "'No, my dear Martha, he will eat no more. "'No one in the house is to eat anything at all. "'Uncle Liedenbrock is going to make us all fast "'until he has succeeded in deciphering an undecipherable scrawl. "'Oh, my dear, must we then all die of hunger?' "'I hardly dared to confess that, "'with so absolute a ruler as my uncle,' This fate was inevitable. The old servant, visibly moved, returned to the kitchen, moaning piteously. When I was alone, I thought I would go and tell Groiben all about it. But how should I be able to escape from the house? The professor might return at any moment. And suppose he called me? And suppose he tackled me again with this logomachy, which might vainly have been set before ancient Oedipus? and if I did not obey his call, who could answer for what might happen? The wisest course was to remain where I was. A mineralogist at Benzanson had just sent us a collection of siliceous nodules, which I had to classify. So I set to work. I sorted, labeled, and arranged in their own glass case all these hollow specimens, in the cavity of each of which was a nest of little crystals. But this work did not succeed in absorbing all my attention. That old document kept working in my brain. My head throbbed with excitement, and I felt an undefined uneasiness. I was possessed with a presentiment of coming evil. In an hour my nodules were all arranged upon successive shelves. Then I dropped down into the old velvet armchair, my head thrown back and my hands joined over it. I lighted my long, crooked pipe, with a painting on it of an idle-looking naiad. Then I amused myself watching the process of the conversion of the tobacco into carbon, which was by slow degrees making my naiad into a negress. Now and then I listened to hear whether a well-known step was on the stairs. No. Where could my uncle be at that moment? I fancied him running under the noble trees which lined the road to Altona, gesticulating, making shots with his cane, thrashing the long grass, cutting the heads off the thistles, and disturbing the contemplative storks in their peaceful solitude. Would he return in triumph or in discouragement? Which would get the upper hand, he or the secret? I was thus asking myself questions, and mechanically taking between my fingers the sheet of paper mysteriously disfigured with the incomprehensible succession of letters I had written down, and I repeated to myself, What does it all mean? I sought to group the letters so as to form words. Quite impossible. When I put them together by twos, threes, fives, or sixes, nothing came of it but nonsense. To be sure, the fourteenth, fifteenth, and sixteenth letters made the English word ice. The eighty-third and two following made sir, and in the midst of the document, in the second and third lines, I observed the words rots, mutable, ira, net, and atra. Come now, I thought. These words seem to justify my uncle's view about the language of the document. In the fourth line appear the word luco, which means a sacred wood. It is true that in the third line was the word tabild, which looked like Hebrew, and in the last, the purely French words, mer, arc, mer. All this was enough to drive a poor fellow crazy. Four different languages in this ridiculous sentence. What connection could there possibly be between such words as ice, sir, anger, cruel, sacred wood, changeable, mother, bow, and sea? The first and the last might have something to do with each other. It was not at all surprising that in a document written in Iceland there should be mention of a sea of ice. 
but it was quite another thing to get to the end of this cryptogram with so small a clue. So I was struggling with an insurmountable difficulty. My brain got heated. My eyes watered over that sheet of paper. Its hundred and thirty-two letters seemed to flutter and fly around me, like those motes of mingled light and darkness which float in the air around the head when the blood is rushing upwards with undue violence. I was a prey to a kind of hallucination. I was stifling. I wanted air. Unconsciously, I fanned myself with the bit of paper, the back and front of which successively came before my eyes. What was my surprise when, in one of those rapid revolutions, at the moment when the back was turned to me, I thought I caught sight of the Latin words craterem, terrestre, and others. A sudden light burst in upon me. These hints alone gave me the first glimpse of the truth. I had discovered the key to the cipher. To read the document, it would not even be necessary to read it through the paper. Such as it was, just such as it had been dictated to me, so it might be spelt out with ease. All those ingenious professorial combinations were coming right. He was right as to the arrangement of the letters. He was right as to the language. He had been within a hair's breadth of reading this Latin document from end to end, but that hair's breadth, chance had given it to me. You may be sure I felt stirred up. My eyes were dim, I could scarcely see. I had laid the paper upon the table. At a glance, I could tell the whole secret. At last I became more calm. I made a wise resolve to walk twice round the room quietly and settle my nerves, and then I returned into the deep gulf of the huge armchair. Now I'll read it, I cried, after having well distended my lungs with air. I leaned over the table. I laid my finger successively upon every letter, and without a pause, without one moment's hesitation, I read off the whole sentence aloud. Stupefaction! Terror! I sat overwhelmed as if with a sudden deadly blow. What? That which I read had actually really been done? A mortal man had had the audacity to penetrate— Ah! I cried, springing up. But no, no, my uncle shall never know it. He would insist upon doing it too. He would want to know all about it. Ropes could not hold him, such a determined geologist as he is. He would start, he would, in spite of everything and everybody, and he would take me with him, and we should never get back. No, never, never. My overexcitement was beyond all description. No, no, it shall not be, I declared energetically. And as it is in my power to prevent the knowledge of it coming into the mind of my tyrant, I will do it. By dint of turning this document round and round, he too might discover the key. I will destroy it. There was a little fire left on the hearth. I seized not only the paper, but Sacknesum's parchment. With a feverish hand, I was about to fling it all upon the coals, and utterly destroy and abolish this dangerous secret, when the study door opened, and my uncle appeared. CHAPTER V. FAMINE, THEN VICTORY, FOLLOWED BY DISMAY I had only just time to replace the unfortunate document upon the table. Professor Liedenbrock seemed to be greatly abstracted. The ruling thought gave him no rest. Evidently he had gone deeply into the matter, analytically and with profound scrutiny. He had brought all the resources of his mind to bear upon it during his walk, and he had come back to apply some new combination. He sat in his armchair, and pen in hand he began what looked very much like algebraic formulae. I followed with my eyes his trembling hands. I took count of every movement. Might not some unhoped-for result come of it? I trembled, too, very unnecessarily, since the true key was in my hands, and no other would open the secret. For three long hours my uncle worked on without a word, without lifting his head, rubbing out, beginning again, then rubbing out again, and so on a hundred times. 
I knew very well that if he succeeded in setting down these letters in every possible relative position, the sentence would come out. But I knew also that twenty letters alone could form two quintillions, four hundred and thirty-two quadrillions, nine hundred and two trillions, eight billions, a hundred and seventy-six millions, six hundred and forty thousand combinations. Now here were a hundred and thirty-two letters in this sentence, and these hundred and thirty-two letters would give a number of different sentences, each made up of at least a hundred and thirty-three figures, a number which passed far beyond all calculation or conception. So I felt reassured as far as regarded this heroic method of solving the difficulty. But time was passing away. Night came on. The street noises ceased. My uncle, bending over his task, noticed nothing, not even Martha half opening the door. He heard not a sound, not even that excellent woman saying, "'Will not monsieur take any supper to-night?' And poor Martha had to go away unanswered. As for me, after long resistance, I was overcome by sleep, and fell off at the end of the sofa, while Uncle Liedenbrock went on calculating and rubbing out his calculations. When I awoke next morning, that indefatigable worker was still at his post. His red eyes, his pale complexion, his hair tangled between his feverish fingers, the red spots on his cheeks, revealed his desperate struggle with impossibilities and the weariness of spirit, the mental wrestlings he must have undergone all through that unhappy night. To tell the plain truth, I pitied him. In spite of the reproaches which I considered I had a right to lay upon him, a certain feeling of compassion was beginning to gain upon me. The poor man was so entirely taken up with his one idea that he had even forgotten how to get angry. All the strength of his feelings was concentrated upon one point alone, and as their usual vent was closed, it was to be feared lest extreme tension should give rise to an explosion sooner or later. I might with a word have loosened the screw of the steel vice that was crushing his brain, but that word I would not speak. Yet I was not an ill-natured fellow. Why was I dumb at such a crisis? Why so insensible to my uncle's interests? No, no, I repeated, I shall not speak. He would insist upon going. Nothing on earth could stop him. His imagination is a volcano, and to do that which other geologists have never done, he would risk his life. I will preserve silence. I will keep the secret which mere chance has revealed to me. To discover it would be to kill Professor Liedenbrock, let him find it out himself if he can. I will never have it laid to my door that I led him to his destruction. Having formed this resolution, I folded my arms and waited. But I had not reckoned upon one little incident which turned up a few hours after. When our good Martha wanted to go to market, she found the door locked. The big key was gone. Who could have taken it out? Assuredly it was my uncle when he returned the night before from his hurried walk. Was this done on purpose, or was it a mistake? Did he want to reduce us by famine? This seemed like going rather too far. What, should Martha and I be victims of a position of things in which we had not the smallest interest? It was a fact that a few years before this, whilst my uncle was working at his great classification of minerals, he was forty-eight hours without eating and all his household were obliged to share in this scientific fast. As for me, what I remember is that I got severe cramps in my stomach, which hardly suited the constitution of a hungry, growing lad. Now it appeared to me as if breakfast was going to be wanting, just as supper had been the night before. Yet I resolved to be a hero, and not to be conquered by the pangs of hunger. Martha took it very seriously, and— poor woman, was very much distressed. As for me, the impossibility of leaving the house distressed me a good deal more, and for a very good reason. A caged lover's feelings may easily be imagined. My uncle went on working. His imagination went off rambling into the ideal world of combinations. He was far away from earth, and really far away from earthly wants. 
About noon, hunger began to stimulate me severely. Martha had, without thinking any harm, cleared out the larder the night before, so that now there was nothing left in the house. Still I held out. I made it a point of honor. Two o'clock struck. This was becoming ridiculous. Worse than that, unbearable. I began to say to myself that I was exaggerating the importance of the document, that my uncle would surely not believe in it, that he would set it down as a mere puzzle, that if it came to the worst we should lay violent hands on him and keep him at home if he thought on venturing on the expedition, that, after all, he might himself discover the key of the cipher, and that then I should be clear at the mere expense of my involuntary abstinence. These reasons seemed excellent to me, though on the night before I should have rejected them with indignation. I even went so far as to condemn myself for my absurdity in having waited so long, and I finally resolved to let it all out. I was therefore meditating a proper introduction to the matter, so as not to seem too abrupt, when the professor jumped up, clapped on his hat, and prepared to go out. Surely he was not going out to shut us in again. No, never. Uncle, I cried. He seemed not to hear me. Uncle Liedenbrock, I cried, lifting up my voice. Ay, he answered, like a man suddenly waking. Uncle, that key. What key? The door key? No, no, I cried. The key of the document. The professor stared at me over his spectacles. No doubt he saw something unusual in the expression of my countenance, for he laid hold of my arm and speechlessly questioned me with his eyes. Yes, never was a question more forcibly put. I nodded my head up and down. He shook his pityingly, as if he was dealing with a lunatic. I gave a more affirmative gesture. His eyes glistened and sparkled with live fire. His hand was shaken threateningly. This mute conversation at such a momentous crisis would have riveted the attention of the most indifferent. And the fact really was that I dared not speak now, so intense was the excitement for fear lest my uncle should smother me in his first joyful embraces. But he became so urgent that I was at last compelled to answer. Yes, that key, chance... "'What is that you are saying?' he shouted with indescribable emotion. "'There, read that,' I said, presenting a sheet of paper on which I had written. "'But there is nothing in this,' he answered, crumpling up the paper. "'No, nothing until you proceed to read from the end to the beginning.' I had not finished my sentence when the professor broke out into a cry, nay, a roar. A new revelation burst in upon him. He was transformed. Aha! Clever Sacknessum! he cried. You had first written out your sentence the wrong way. And darting upon the paper, with eyes bedimmed and voice choked with emotion, he read the whole document from the last letter to the first. It was conceived in the following terms. In Sneffels Joculus Craterum Quem Delibat Umbra Scartaris Julii intra calendas descende, audax viator, et terrestre centrum atinges, quod fessi arne sacnusum, which bad Latin may be translated thus. Descend, bold traveller, into the crater of the yokel of Sneffels, which the chateau of Scartaris touches before the calends of July, and you will attain the centre of the earth, which I have done, arne sacnusum. In reading this, my uncle gave a spring, as if he had touched a laden jar. His audacity, his joy, and his convictions were magnificent to behold. He came and he went. He seized his head between both his hands. He pushed the chairs out of their places. He piled up his books. Incredible as it may seem, he rattled his precious nodules of flints together. He sent a kick here, a thump there. At last his nerves calmed down and like a man exhausted by too lavish an expenditure of vital power, he sank back exhausted into his armchair. "'What o'clock is it?' he asked, after a few moments of silence. 
Three o'clock, I replied. Is it really? The dinner hour is past, and I did not know it. I am half dead with hunger. Come on, and after dinner... Well? After dinner, pack up my trunk. What? I cried. And yours, replied the indefatigable professor, entering the dining room. Chapter 6 Exciting Discussions About an Unparalleled Enterprise At these words a cold shiver ran through me. Yet I controlled myself. I even resolved to put a good face upon it. Scientific arguments alone could have any weight with Professor Liedenbrock. Now there were good ones against the practicability of such a journey. Penetrate to the center of the earth? What nonsense! But I kept my dialectic battery in reserve for a suitable opportunity, and I interested myself in the prospect of my dinner, which was not yet forthcoming. It is no use to tell of the rage and imprecations of my uncle before the empty table. Explanations were given, Martha was set at liberty, ran off to the market, and did her part so well that in an hour afterwards my hunger was appeased, and I was able to return to the contemplation of the gravity of the situation. During all dinner-time my uncle was almost merry. He indulged in some of those learned jokes which never do anybody any harm. Dessert over, he beckoned me into his study. I obeyed. He sat at one end of his table, I at the other. Axel, said he very mildly, you are a very ingenious young man. You have done me a splendid service at a moment when, wearied out with the struggle, I was going to abandon the contest. Where should I have lost myself? None can tell. Never, my lad, shall I forget it, and you shall have your share in the glory to which your discovery will lead. Oh, come, thought I, he is in a good way. Now is the time for discussing that same glory. Before all things, my uncle resumed, I enjoin you to preserve the most inviolable secrecy. You understand? There are not a few in the scientific world who envy my success, and many would be ready to undertake this enterprise, to whom our return should be the first news of it. Do you really think there are many people bold enough? said I. Certainly. Who would hesitate to acquire such renown? If that document were divulged, a whole army of geologists would be ready to rush into the footsteps of Arne Saknussem. I don't feel so very sure of that, uncle, I replied, for we have no proof of the authenticity of this document. What, not of the book inside which we have discovered it? Granted, I admit that Saknussem may have written these lines, but does it follow that he has really accomplished such a journey? And may it not be that this old parchment is intended to mislead? I almost regretted having uttered this last word, which dropped from me in an unguarded moment. The professor bent his shaggy brows, and I feared I had seriously compromised my own safety. Happily, no great harm came of it. A smile flitted across the lip of my severe companion, and he answered, That is what we shall see. Ah, said I, rather put out, but do let me exhaust all the possible objections against this document. Speak, my boy, don't be afraid. You are quite at liberty to express your opinions. You are no longer my nephew only, but my colleague. Pray go on. Well, in the first place, I wish to ask what are this yokel, this sneffles, and this scartaris, names which I have never heard before. Nothing easier. I received not long ago a map from my friend Augustus Petermann at Leipzig. Nothing could be more apropos. Take down the third atlas in the second shelf in the large bookcase, series Z, plate four. I rose, and with the help of such precise instructions could not fail to find the required atlas. My uncle opened it and said, Here is one of the best maps of Iceland, that of Handerson, and I believe this will solve the worst of our difficulties. I bent over the map. You see this volcanic island, said the professor. Observe that all the volcanoes are called yokels, a word which means glacier in Icelandic. 
and under the high latitude of Iceland, nearly all the active volcanoes discharge through beds of ice. Hence, this term of yokel is applied to all the eruptive mountains in Iceland. Very good, said I. But what of Sneffels? I was hoping that this question would be unanswerable, but I was mistaken. My uncle replied, Follow my finger along the west coast of Iceland. Do you see Reykjavik, the capital? You do. Well, ascend the innumerable fjords that indent those sea-beaten shores and stop at the sixty-fifth degree of latitude. What do you see there? I see a peninsula looking like a thigh-bone with the knee-bone at the end of it. A very fair comparison, my lad. Now do you see anything upon that knee-bone? Yes, a mountain rising out of the sea. Right. That is Sneffel. That Sneffel? It is. It is a mountain five thousand feet high, one of the most remarkable in the world, if its crater leads down to the center of the earth. But that is impossible, I said, shrugging my shoulders, and disgusted at such a ridiculous supposition. Impossible, said the professor severely. And why, pray? Because this crater is evidently filled with lava and burning rocks, and therefore... But suppose it is an extinct volcano. Extinct? Yes. The number of active volcanoes on the surface of the globe is at the present time only about three hundred, but there is a very much larger number of extinct ones. Now, Sneffel is one of these. Since historic times there has been but one eruption of this mountain, that of 1219. From that time it has quieted down more and more, and now it is no longer reckoned among active volcanoes. To such positive statements I could make no reply. I therefore took refuge in other dark passages of the document. What is the meaning of this word Scarteris, and what have the Calends of July to do with it? My uncle took a few minutes to consider. For one short moment I felt a ray of hope, speedily to be extinguished. For he soon answered thus, What is darkness to you is light to me. This proves the ingenious care with which Sacknesum guarded and defined his discovery. Sneffels, or Sneffel, has several craters. It was therefore necessary to point out which of these leads to the center of the globe. What did the Icelandic sage do? He observed that at the approach of the Calends of July, that is to say, in the last day of June, one of the peaks, called Scartaris, flung its shadow down the mouth of that particular crater, and he committed that fact to his document. Could there possibly have been a more exact guide? As soon as we have arrived at the summit of Sneffel, we shall have no hesitation as to the proper road to take. Decidedly, my uncle had answered every one of my objections. I saw that his position on the old parchment was impregnable. I therefore ceased to press him upon that part of the subject, and as above all things you must be convinced, I passed on to scientific objections which in my opinion were far more serious. Well then, I said, I am forced to admit that Sacknesum's sentence is clear, and leaves no room for doubt. I will even allow that the document bears every mark and evidence of authenticity. That learned philosopher did get to the bottom of Sneffels. He has seen the shadow of Scartaris touch the edge of the crater before the Calends of July. He may even have heard the legendary stories told in his day about that crater reaching to the center of the world. But as for reaching it himself, as for performing the journey, and returning if he ever went, I say no, he never, never did that. Now for your reason, said my uncle ironically. All the theories of science demonstrate such a feat to be impracticable. The theories say that, do they? replied the professor in the tone of a meek disciple. Oh, unpleasant theories! How the theories will hinder us, won't they? I saw that he was only laughing at me, but I went on all the same. Yes, it is perfectly well known that the internal temperature rises one degree for every seventy feet in depth. Now, admitting this proportion to be constant, and the radius of the earth being fifteen hundred leagues, there must be a temperature of three hundred sixty thousand thirty-two degrees at the center of the earth. Therefore, all the substances that compose the body of this earth must exist there in a state of incandescent gas, for the metals that most resist the action of heat— 
gold and platinum and the hardest rocks can never be either solid or liquid under such a temperature i have therefore good reason for asking if it is possible to penetrate through such a medium so axel it is the heat that troubles you of course it is were we to reach a depth of thirty miles we should have arrived at the limit of the terrestrial crust for there the temperature will be more than two thousand three hundred seventy two degrees are you afraid of being put into a state of fusion I will leave you to decide that question, I answered rather sullenly. This is my decision, replied Professor Liedenbrock, putting on one of his grandest airs. Neither you nor anybody else knows with any certainty what is going on in the interior of this globe, since not the twelve-thousandth part of its radius is known. Science is eminently perfectible, and every new theory is soon routed by a newer. Was it not always believed until Fourier that the temperature of the interplanetary spaces decreased perpetually? And is it not known at the present time that the greatest cold of the ethereal regions is never lower than forty degrees below zero? Why should it not be the same with the internal heat? Why should it not, at a certain depth, attain an impassable limit, instead of rising to such a point as to fuse the most infusible metals? As my uncle was now taking his stand upon hypotheses, of course, there was nothing to be said. Well, I will tell you that true savants, among them Poisson, have demonstrated that if a heat of 360,000 degrees existed in the interior of the globe, the fiery gases arising from the fused matter would acquire an elastic force which the crust of the earth would be unable to resist, and that it would explode like the plates of a bursting boiler. That is Poisson's opinion, my uncle, nothing more. Granted, but it is likewise the creed adopted by other distinguished geologists, that the interior of the globe is neither gas nor water, nor any of the heaviest minerals known, for in none of these cases would the earth weigh what it does. Oh, with figures you may prove anything. But is it the same with facts? Is it not known that the number of volcanoes has diminished since the first days of creation? And if there is central heat, may we not thence conclude that it is in process of diminution? My good uncle, if you will enter into the region of speculation, I can discuss the matter no longer. But I have to tell you that the highest names have come to the support of my views. Do you remember a visit paid to me by the celebrated chemist Humphrey Davy in 1825? Not at all, for I was not born until nineteen years afterwards. Well, Humphrey Davy did call upon me on his way through Hamburg.
Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne Chapter 7 A Woman's Courage Thus ended this memorable seance. That conversation threw me into a fever. I came out of my uncle's study as if I had been stunned, and as if there was not air enough in all the streets of Hamburg to put me right again. I therefore made for the banks of the Elbe, where the steamer lands her passengers, which forms a communication between the city and the Hamburg railway. Was I convinced of the truth of what I had heard? Had I not bent under the iron rule of the Professor Liedenbrock? Was I to believe him in earnest in his intention to penetrate to the center of this massive globe? Had I been listening to the mad speculations of a lunatic, or to the scientific conclusions of a lofty genius? Where did truth stop? Where did error begin? I was all adrift amongst a thousand contradictory hypotheses, but I could not lay hold of one. Yet I remembered that I had been convinced, although now my enthusiasm was beginning to cool down, but I felt a desire to start at once, and not to lose time and courage by calm reflection. I had at that moment quite courage enough to strap my knapsack to my shoulders and start. But I must confess that in another hour this unnatural excitement abated. My nerves became unstrung, and from the depths of the abysses, of this earth I ascended to its surface again. It is quite absurd, I cried. There is no sense about it. No sensible young man should for a moment entertain such a proposal. The whole thing is non-existent. I have had a bad night. I have been dreaming of horrors. But I had followed the banks of the Elbe and passed the town. After passing the port too I had reached Altona Road. I was led by a presentiment soon to be realized, for shortly I espied my little Grauben, bravely returning with her light step to Hamburg. Grauben! I cried from far off. The young girl stopped, rather frightened perhaps to hear her name called after her on the high road. Ten yards more, and I had joined her. Axel! she cried surprised. What? Have you come to meet me? Is this why you are here, sir? But when she had looked upon me, Grauen could not fail to see the uneasiness and distress of my mind. What is the matter, she said, holding out her hand. What is the matter, Grauen? I cried. In a couple of minutes, my pretty Virlandaise was fully informed of the position of affairs. For a time she was silent. Did her heart palpitate as mine did? I don't know about that, but I know her hand did not tremble in mine. We went on a hundred yards without speaking. At last she said, Axel, my dear Grauben, that will be a splendid journey. I gave a bound at these words. Yes, Axel, a journey worthy of the nephew of a savant. It is a good thing for a man to be distinguished by some great enterprise. What, Grauben, won't you dissuade me from such an undertaking? No, my dear Axel, and I would willingly go with you, but that a poor girl would only be in your way. Is that quite true? It is true. Ah, women and young girls! How incomprehensible are your feminine hearts! When you are not the timidest, you are the bravest of creatures. Reason has nothing to do with your actions. What? Did this child encourage me in such an expedition? Would she not be afraid to join herself? And as she was driving me to it, one whom she loved? I was disconcerted, and if I must tell the whole truth, I was ashamed. Grauben, we will see whether you will say the same thing tomorrow. Tomorrow, my dear Axel, I will say what I say today. Grauben and I, hand in hand, but in silence, pursued our way. The emotions of that day were breaking my heart. 
It was night when we arrived at the house in Koningstrasse. I expected to find all quiet there, my uncle in bed as was his custom, and Martha giving her last touches with the feather brush. But I had not taken into account the professor's impatience. I found him shouting and working himself up amidst a crowd of porters and messengers who were all depositing various loads in the passage. Our old servant was at her wit's end. "'Come, Axel, come, you miserable wretch!' my uncle cried from as far off as he could see me. "'Your boxes are not packed, and my papers are not arranged. Where is the key of my carpet-bag? And what have you done with my gaiters?' I was thunderstruck. My voice failed. Scarcely could my lips utter the words. "'Are we really going?' "'Of course, you unhappy boy! Could I have dreamed that you would have gone out for a walk instead of hurrying your preparations forward?' "'Are we to go?' I asked again, with sinking hopes. "'Yes, the day after tomorrow, early.' I could hear no more. I fled for refuge into my own little room. All hope was now at an end. My uncle had been all the morning making purchases of a part of the tools and apparatus required for this desperate undertaking. The passage was encumbered with rope ladders, knotted cords, torches, flasks, grappling irons, alpenstocks, pickaxes, iron-shod sticks, enough to load ten men. I spent an awful night. Next morning I was called early. I had quite decided I would not open the door. But how was I to resist the sweet voice which was always music to my ears, saying, My dear Axel? I came out of my room. I thought my pale countenance and my red sleepless eyes would work upon Grauben's sympathies and change her mind. "'Ah, my dear Axel,' she said, "'I see you are better. "'A night's rest has done you good.' "'Done me good,' I exclaimed. "'I rushed to the glass. "'Well, in fact, I did look better than I had expected. "'I could hardly believe my own eyes. "'Axel,' she said, "'I've had a long talk with my guardian.' He is a bold philosopher, a man of immense courage, and you must remember that his blood flows in your veins. He has confided to me his plans, his hopes, and why and how he hopes to attain his object. He will no doubt succeed. My dear Axel, it is a grand thing to devote yourself to science. What honor will fall upon Herr Liedenbrock, and so be reflected upon his companion? When you return, Axel, you will be a man his equal, free to speak and act independently, and free to... The dear girl only finished this sentence by blushing. Her words revived me, yet I refused to believe we should start. I drew Grauben into the professor's study. Uncle, is it true that we are to go? Why do you doubt? Well, I don't doubt... I said, not to vex him. But I ask, what need is there to hurry? Time, time flying with irreparable rapidity. But it is only the 16th of May. And until the end of June... What, you monument of ignorance? Do you think you can get to Iceland in a couple of days? If you had not deserted me like a fool, I should have taken you to the Copenhagen office to Liffender and company, and you would have learned then that there is only one trip every month from Copenhagen to Reykjavik on the 22nd. Well? Well, if we wait for the 22nd of June, we should be too late to see the shadow of Scartaris touch the crater of Snefels. Therefore we must get to Copenhagen as fast as we can to secure our passage. Go and pack up. There was no reply to this. I went to my room. Grauben followed me. She undertook to pack up all things necessary for my voyage. She was no more moved than if I had been starting 
for a little trip to Lübeck or Heligoland. Her little hands moved without haste. She talked quietly. She supplied me with sensible reasons for her expedition. She delighted me. And yet I was angry with her. Now and then I felt I ought to break out into a passion. But she took no notice and went on her way as methodically as ever. Finally the last strap was buckled. I came downstairs. All that day the philosophical instrument makers and the electricians kept coming and going. Martha was distracted. Is Master mad? she asked. I nodded my head. And is he going to take you with him? I nodded again. Where to? I pointed my finger downwards. Down into the cellar? cried the old servant. No, I said, lower down than that. Night came, but I knew nothing about the lapse of time. Tomorrow morning, at six precisely, my uncle decreed, we start. At ten o'clock I fell upon my bed, a dead lump of inert matter. All through the night the terror had hold of me. I spent it dreaming of abysses. I was a prey to delirium. I felt myself grasped by the professor's sinewy hand, dragged along, hurled down, shattered into little bits. I dropped down unfathomable precipices with the accelerating velocity of bodies falling through space. My life had become an endless fall. I awoke at five with shattered nerves, trembling and weary. I came downstairs. My uncle was at table, devouring his breakfast. I stared at him with horror and disgust. But dear Grauben was there, so I said nothing, and could eat nothing. At half-past five there was a rattle of wheels outside. A large carriage was there to take us to the Altona railway station. It was soon piled up with my uncle's multifarious preparations. "'Where is your box?' he cried. It is ready, I replied with faltering voice. Then make haste down, or we shall lose the train. It was now manifestly impossible to maintain the struggle against destiny. I went up again to my room, and rolling my portmanteus downstairs, I darted after him. At that moment my uncle was solemnly investing Grauben with the reins of government. My pretty Virlandaise was as calm and collected as was her wont. She kissed her guardian, but could not restrain a tear in touching my cheek with her gentle lips. Grauben, I murmured. Go, my dear Axel, go. I am now your betrothed, and when you come back I will be your wife. I pressed her in my arms and took my place in the carriage. Martha and the young girl, standing at the door, waved their last farewell, and then the horses, roused by the driver's whistling, darted off at a gallop upon the road to Altona. A Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne Chapter 8 Serious Preparations for Vertical Descent Altona, which is but a suburb of Hamburg, is the terminus of the Kiel Railway, which was to carry us to the belts. In twenty minutes we were in Holstein. At half-past six the carriage stopped at the station. My uncle's numerous packages, his voluminous impedimenta, were unloaded, removed, labeled, weighed, put in the luggage vans, and at seven we were seated face to face in our compartment. The whistle sounded, the engine started, we were off. Was I resigned? No, not yet. Yet the cool morning air and the scenes on the road, rapidly changed by the swiftness of the train, drew me away somewhat from my sad reflections. As for the professor's reflections, 
they went far in advance of the swiftest express. We were alone in the carriage, but we sat in silence. My uncle examined all his pockets and his traveling bag with the minutest care. I saw that he had not forgotten the smallest matter of detail. Amongst other documents, a sheet of paper carefully folded bore the heading of the Danish consulate, with the signature of W. Christensen, consul at Hamburg and the professor's friend. With this we possessed the proper introductions to the governor of Iceland. I also observed the famous document most carefully laid up in a secret pocket in his portfolio. I bestowed a malediction upon it, and then proceeded to examine the country. It was a very long succession of uninteresting, loamy, and fertile flats, a very easy country for the construction of railways, and propitious for the laying down of these direct level lines so dear to railway companies. I had no time to get tired of the monotony, for in three hours we stopped at Kiel, close to the sea. The luggage, being labelled for Copenhagen, we had no occasion to look after it. Yet the professor watched every article with jealous vigilance, until all were safe on board. There they disappeared in the hold. My uncle, notwithstanding his hurry, had so well calculated the relations between the train and the steamer that we had a whole day to spare. The steamer, Eleonora, did not start until night. Then sprang a feverish state of excitement in which the impatient, irascible traveller devoted to perdition the railway directors, and the steamboat companies, and the governments which allowed such intolerable slowness. I was obliged to act chorus to him when he attacked the captain of the Eleonora upon this subject. The captain disposed of us summarily. At Kiel, as elsewhere, we must do something to while away the time. What with walking on the verdant shores of the bay within which nestles the little town, exploring thick woods which make it look like a nest embowered amongst thick foliage, admiring the villas, each provided with a little bathing-house, and moving about and grumbling, at last ten o'clock came. The heavy coils of smoke from the Eleanor's funnel unrolled in the sky, the bridge shook with the quivering of the struggling steam. We were on board, and owners for the time of two berths, one over the other, in the only saloon cabin on board. At a quarter past the moorings were loosed, and the throbbing steamer pursued her way over the dark waters of the great belt. The night was dark. There was a sharp breeze and a rough sea. A few lights appeared on shore through the thick darkness. Later on, I cannot tell when, a dazzling light from some lighthouse threw a bright stream of fire along the waves, and this is all I can remember of this first portion of our sail. At seven in the morning we landed at Corsor, a small town on the west coast of Zealand. There we were transferred from the boat to another line of railway, which took us by just as flat a country as the plain of Holstein. Three hours' travelling brought us to the capital of Denmark. My uncle had not shut his eyes all night. In his impatience, I believe, he was trying to accelerate the train with his feet. At last he discerned a stretch of sea. The sound, he cried. At our left was a huge building that looked like a hospital. That's a lunatic asylum, said one of our traveling companions. Very good, thought I, just the place we want to end our days in, and great as it is that asylum is not big enough to contain all Professor Liedenbrock's madness. At ten in the morning at last we set our feet in Copenhagen. The luggage was put upon a carriage and taken with ourselves to the Phoenix Hotel in Breda Gate, this took half an hour, for the station is out of town. Then my uncle, after a hasty toilet, dragged me after him. The porter at the hotel could speak German and English, 
but the professor, as a polygot, questioned him in good Danish, and it was in the same language that the personage directed him to the Museum of Northern Antiquities. The curator of this curious establishment, in which wonders are gathered together, out of which the ancient history of the country might be reconstructed by means of its stone weapons, its cups, and its jewels, was a learned savant, the friend of the Danish consul at Hamburg, Professor Thomson. My uncle had a cordial letter of introduction to him. As a general rule, one savant greets another with coolness, but here the case was different. Mr. Thompson, like a good friend, gave the Professor Liedenbrock a cordial greeting, and he even vouchsafed the same kindness to his nephew. It is hardly necessary to say the secret was sacredly kept from the excellent curator. We were simply disinterested travellers visiting Iceland, out of harmless curiosity. Mr. Thompson placed his services at our disposal, and we visited the quays with the object of finding out the next vessel to sail. I was yet in hopes that there would be no means of getting to Iceland, but there was no such luck. A small Danish schooner, the Valkyria, was to set sail for Reykjavik on the 2nd of June. The captain, Mr. Bjarn, was on board. His intending passenger was so joyful that he almost squeezed his hands till he ached. That good man was rather surprised at his energy. To him it seemed a very simple thing to go to Iceland, as that was his business. But to my uncle it was sublime. The worthy captain took advantage of his enthusiasm to charge double fares, but we did not trouble ourselves about mere trifles. "'You must be on board on Tuesday at seven in the morning,' said Captain Bjarn, after having pocketed more dollars than were his due. Then we thanked Mr. Thompson for his kindness, and we returned to the Phoenix Hotel. "'It's all right, it's all right,' my uncle repeated. "'How fortunate we are to have found this boat ready for sailing. "'Now let us have some breakfast and go about the town.' "'We went first to Coggins Nytorv, an irregular square in which are two innocent-looking guns, which need not alarm anyone. Close by, at number five, there was a French restaurant kept by a cook of the name of Vincent, where we had an ample breakfast for four marks each. Then I took a childish pleasure in exploring the city. My uncle let me take him with me, but he took notice of nothing, neither the insignificant king's palace, nor the pretty seventeenth-century bridge, which spans the canal before the museum, nor that immense cenotaph of Torvaldsens, adorned with horrible mural painting, and containing within it a collection of the sculptor's works, nor in a fine park the toy-like chateau of Rosenberg, nor the beautiful Renaissance edifice of the exchange, nor its spire composed of the twisted tails of four bronze dragons, nor the great windmill on the ramparts, whose huge arm dialed in the sea breeze like the sails of a ship. What delicious walks we should have had together, my pretty Virlandaise and I, along the harbour where the two deckers and the frigates slept peaceably by the red roofing of the warehouse, by the green banks of the strait, through the deep shades of the trees amongst which the fort is half concealed where the guns are thrusting out their black throats between branches of alder and willow. But alas, Grauben was far away, and I never hoped to see her again. But if my uncle felt no attraction towards these romantic scenes, he was very much struck with the aspect of a certain church spire situated in the island of Amak, which forms the southwest quarter of Copenhagen. I was ordered to direct my feet that way. I embarked on a small steamer which piles on the canals, and in a few minutes she touched the quay of the dockyard. After crossing a few narrow streets where some convicts in trousers half yellow and half grey were at work under the orders of the gangers, we arrived at the Vor Frelser's Kirk. 
There was nothing remarkable about the church, but there was a reason why its tall spire had attracted the professor's attention. Starting from the top of the tower, an external staircase wound around the spire, the spirals circling up into the sky. Let us get to the top, said my uncle. I shall be dizzy, I said. The more reason why we should go up. We must get used to it. But come, I tell you, don't waste our time. I had to obey. A keeper who lived at the other end of the street handed us the key, and the ascent began. My uncle went ahead with a light step. I followed him not without alarm, for my head was very apt to feel dizzy. I possessed neither the equilibrium of an eagle nor his fearless nature. As long as we were protected on the inside of the winding staircase up the tower, all was well enough. But after toiling up a hundred and fifty steps, the fresh air came to salute my face, and we were on the leads of the tower. There the aerial staircase began its gyrations, only guarded by a thin iron rail, and the narrowing steps seemed to ascend into infinite space. Never shall I be able to do it, I said. Don't be a coward. Come up, sir, said my uncle with the coldest cruelty. I had to follow, clutching at every step. The keen air made me giddy. I felt the spire rocking with every gust of wind. My knees began to fail. Soon I was crawling on my knees, then creeping on my stomach. I closed my eyes. I seemed to be lost in space. At last I reached the apex with the assistance of my uncle dragging me up by the collar. Look down, he cried, look down well. You must take a lesson in abysses. I opened my eyes. I saw houses squashed flat as if they had all fallen down from the skies. A smoke fog seemed to drown them. Over my head ragged clouds were drifting past, and by an optical inversion they seemed stationary, while the steeple, the ball, and I were all spinning along with fantastic speed. Far away on one side was the green country. On the other the sea sparkled, bathed in sunlight. The sound stretched away to Elsinore, dotted with a few white sails, like seagulls' wings, and in the misty east and away to the northeast lay outstretched the faintly shadowed shores of Sweden. All this immensity of space whirled and wavered, fluctuating beneath my eyes. But I was compelled to rise, to stand up, to look. My first lesson in dizziness lasted an hour. When I got permission to come down and feel the solid street pavements, I was afflicted with severe lumbargo. "'Tomorrow we will do it again,' said the professor. And it was so. For five days in succession I was obliged to undergo this anti-vertiginous exercise. And whether I would or not, I made some improvement in the art of lofty contemplations. End of chapter 8《A Journey to the Center of the Earth》by Jules Verne. Chapter 9. Iceland. But what next? The day of our departure arrived. The day before it, our kind friend Mr. Thompson brought us letters of introduction to the Count Trampe, the governor of Iceland, Mr. Picturson, the bishop's suffragan, and Mr. Finson, mayor of Reykjavik, my uncle expressed his gratitude by tremendous compression of both his hands. On the second, at six in the evening, all our precious baggage being safely on board the Valkyria, the captain took us into a very narrow cabin. "'Is the wind favourable?' my uncle asked. "'Excellent,' replied Captain Bjarn. "'A sou'easter. We shall pass down the sound full speed, with all sails set.' 
In a few minutes the schooner, under her mizen, brigantine, topsail, and topgallant sail, loosed from her moorings and made full sail through the straits. In an hour the capital of Denmark seemed to sink below the distant waves, and the Valkyria was skirting the coast by Elsinore. In my nervous frame of mind I expected to see the ghost of Hamlet wandering on the legendary castle terrace. Sublime madman, I said, no doubt you would approve of our expedition. Perhaps you would keep us company to the center of the globe to find the solution to your eternal doubts. But there was no ghostly shape upon the ancient walls. Indeed the castle is much younger than the heroic Prince of Denmark. It now answers the purpose of a sumptuous lodge for the doorkeeper of the Straits of the Sound, before which every year there pass fifteen thousand ships of all nations. The castle of Kronsberg soon disappeared in the mist, as well as the tower of Helsingborg, built on the Swedish coast, and the schooner passed lightly on her way, urged by the breezes of the Kattegat. The Valkyria was a splendid sailor, but on a sailing vessel you can place no dependence. She was taking to Reykjavik coal, household goods, earthenware, woolen clothing, and a cargo of wheat. The crew consisted of five men, all Danes. How long will the passage take? my uncle asked. Ten days, replied the captain if we don't meet a nor'wester in passing the pharaohs. But are you not subject to considerable delays? No, Mr. Liedenbrocken, don't be uneasy. We shall get there in good time. At evening the schooner doubled the scraw at the northern point of Denmark. In the night passed the Skager Rock, skirted Norway by Cape Lindness, and entered the North Sea. In two days more we sighted the coast of Scotland near Peterhead, and the Valkyria turned her lead towards the Faroe Islands, passing between the Orkneys and the Shetlands. Soon the schooner encountered the great Atlantic swell. She had to tack against the north wind, and reach the Faroes only with some difficulty. On the 8th the captain made out Myganus, the southernmost of these islands, and from that moment took a straight course for Cape Portland, the most southerly point of Iceland. The passage was marked with nothing unusual. I bore the troubles of the sea pretty well. My uncle, to his own intense disgust, and his great shame, was ill all through the voyage. He was therefore unable to converse with the captain about Snaffel. The way to get to it, the facilities for transport. He was obliged to put off these inquiries until his arrival, and spent all his time at full length in his cabin, of which the timbers creaked and shook with every pitch she took. It must be confessed that he was not undeserving of his punishment. On the 11th we reached Cape Portland. The clear, open weather gave us a good view of Myrdal's Yokel, which overhangs it. The cape is merely a low hill, with steep sides, standing lonely by the beach. The Valkyria kept at some distance from the coast, taking a westerly course amidst great shoals of whales and sharks. Soon we came in sight of an enormous perforated rock, through which the sea dashed furiously. The Westman islets seemed to rise out of the ocean like a group of rocks in a liquid plain. From that time... The schooner took a wide berth and swept at a great distance round Cape Reykjanes, which forms the western point of Iceland. The rough sea prevented my uncle from coming on deck to admire these shattered and surf-beaten coasts. Forty-eight hours after, coming out of a storm which forced the schooner to scud under bare poles, we sighted east of us the beacon of Cape Skagen, where dangerous rocks extend far away seaward. An Icelandic pilot came on board, and in three hours the Valkyria dropped her anchor before Reykjavik, 
in Faxa Bay. The professor at last emerged from his cabin, rather pale and wretched looking, but still full of enthusiasm, and with ardent satisfaction shining on his eyes. The population of the town, wonderfully interested in the arrival of a vessel from which everyone expected something, formed in groups upon the quay. My uncle left in haste his floating prison, or rather hospital, but before quitting the deck of the schooner he dragged me forward, and pointing with outstretched finger north of the bay at a distant mountain terminating in a double peak, a pair of cones covered with perpetual snow, he cried, Snaffel, Snaffel. Then recommending me, by an impressive gesture, to keep silence, he went into the boat which awaited him. I followed, and presently we were treading the soil of Iceland. The first fellow we saw was a good-looking fellow enough, in a general's uniform. Yet he was not a general, but a magistrate, the governor of the island, Monsieur le Baron Trompe himself. The professor was soon aware of the presence he was in. He delivered him his letters from Copenhagen, and then followed a short conversation in the Danish language, the purport of which I was quite ignorant of and for a very good reason. But the result of this first conversation was that the Baron Trampe placed himself entirely at the service of Professor Liedenbrock. My uncle was just as courteously received by the mayor, Mr. Finson, whose appearance was as military and disposition and office as pacific as the governor's. As for the bishop's suffragan, Mr. Pictorson, he was at that moment engaged on an episcopal visitation in the north. For the time we must be resigned to wait for the honour of being presented to him. But Mr. Fridrikson, professor of natural sciences at the school of Reykjavik, was a delightful man, and his friendship became very precious to me. This modest philosopher spoke only Danish and Latin. He came to proffer me his good offices in the language of Horace, and I felt that we were made to understand each other. In fact, he was the only person in Iceland with whom I could converse at all. This good-natured gentleman made over to us two of the three rooms which his house contained, and we were soon installed in it with our luggage, the abundance of which rather astonished the good people of Reykjavik. "'Well, Axel,' said my uncle, "'we are getting on, and now the worst is over.' The worst, I said, astonished. To be sure, now we have nothing to do but go down. Oh, if that is all, you are quite right. But after all, when we have gone down, we shall have to get up again, I suppose. Oh, I don't trouble myself about that. Come, there is no time to lose. I am going to the library. Perhaps there is some manuscript of Saknusum's there, and I should be glad to consult it. Well, while you are there, I will go into the town, won't you? Oh, that is very uninteresting to me. It is not what is upon this island, but what is underneath that interests me. I went out and wandered wherever chance took me. It would not be easy to lose your way in Reykjavik. I was therefore under no necessity to inquire the road which exposes one to mistakes, when the only medium of intercourse is gesture. The town extends along a low and marshy level, between two hills. An immense bed of lava bounds it on one side, and falls gently towards the sea. On the other extends the vast bay of Faxa, shut in at the north by the enormous glacier of the Snaffel and of which the Valkyria was for the time the only occupant. Usually the English and French conservators of fisheries moor in this bay, but just then they were cruising about the western coasts of the island. The longest of the only two streets that Reykjavik possesses was parallel with the beach. Here lived the merchants and the traders, in wooden cabins made of red planks set horizontally. 
The other street, running west, ends at the little lake between the house of the bishop and other non-commercial people. I had soon explored these melancholy ways. Here and there I got a glimpse of faded turf, looking like a worn-out bit of carpet, or some appearance of a kitchen garden, the sparse vegetables of which, potatoes, cabbages, and lettuce, would have figured appropriately upon a lilliputton table. A few sickly wallflowers were trying to enjoy the air and sunshine. About the middle of the tin commercial street I found the public cemetery, enclosed within a mud wall, where there seemed plenty of room. Then a few steps brought me to the governor's house. Small compared with the town hall of Hamburg, but a palace in comparison with the cabins of the Icelandic population. Between the little lake and the town, the church is built in the Protestant style. Calcined stones extracted out of the volcanoes by their own labor and at their own expense. In high westerly winds, it was manifest that the red tiles of the roof would be scattered in the air to the great danger of the faithful worshippers. On a neighboring hill I perceived the national school, where, as I was informed later by our host, were taught Hebrew, English, French, and Danish, four languages of which, with a shame I confess it, I don't know a single word. After an examination, I should have had to stand last of the forty scholars ed educated at this little college, and I should have been held unworthy to sleep among them in one of those little double closets, where more delicate youths would have died of suffocation at the very first night. In three hours I had seen not only the town, but its environs. The general aspect was wonderfully dull, no trees and scarcely any vegetation. Everywhere bare rocks, signs of volcanic action. The Icelandic butts are made of earth and turf, and the walls slope inward. They rather resemble roofs placed on the ground, but then these roofs are meadows of comparative fertility, thanks to the internal heat. The grass grows on them to some degree of perfection. It is carefully mown in the hay season, if it were not, the horses would come to pasture in, on these green abodes. In my excursion I met but few people. On returning to the main street I found the greater part of the population busied in drying, salting, and putting on board codfish, their chief export. The men looked like robust but heavy blond Germans with pensive eyes, conscious of being far removed from their fellow creatures. Poor exiles, relegated to this land of ice, poor creatures who should have been Eskimo, since nature had condemned them to live only just outside the Arctic Circle. In vain did I try to detect a smile upon their lips. Sometimes, by a spasmodic and involuntary contraction of the muscles, they seemed to laugh, but they never smiled. Their costume consisted of a coarse jacket of black woolen cloth called in Scandinavian lands of Vadmel, a hat with a very broad brim, trousers with a narrow edge of red, and a bit of leather rolled around the foot for shoes. The women looked as sad and as resigned as the men. Their faces were agreeable but expressionless, and they wore gowns and petticoats of dark Vadmel. As maidens they wore over their braided hair a little knitted brown cap, when married, they put around their heads a colored handkerchief, crowned with a peak of white linen. After a good walk, I returned to Mr. Fridrikson's house, where I found my uncle already in his host's company. End of chapter 9 Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne Chapter 10. Interesting Conversations with Icelandic Savants Dinner was ready. Professor Liedenbrock devoured his portion voraciously, for his compulsory fast on board had converted his stomach into a vast unfathomable gulf. There was nothing remarkable in the meal itself, but the hospitality of our host, more Danish than Icelandic, 
reminded me of the heroes of old. It was evident that we were more at home than he was himself. The conversation was carried on in the vernacular tongue, which my uncle mixed with German and Mr. Friedrichsen with Latin for my benefit. It turned upon scientific questions as befits philosophers. But Professor Liedenbrock was excessively reserved, and at every sentence spoke to me with his eyes, enjoining the most absolute silence upon our plans. In the first place, Mr. Friedrichsen wanted to know what success my uncle had had at the library. "'Your library! Why, there is nothing but a few tattered books upon almost deserted shelves!' "'Indeed,' replied Mr. Friedrichsen, "'why we possess eight thousand volumes, many of them valuable and scarce, works in the old Scandinavian language, and we have all the novelties that Copenhagen sends us every year.' "'Where do you keep your eight thousand volumes? For my part, oh, Mr. Liedenbrock, they are all over the country. In this icy region we are fond of study.' There is not a farmer nor a fisherman that cannot read and does not read. Our principle is that books, instead of growing mouldy behind an iron grating, should be worn out under the eyes of many readers. Therefore these volumes are passed from one to another, read over and over, referred to again and again. And it often happens that they find their way back to their shelves only after an absence of a year or two. And in the meantime said my uncle rather spitefully. Strangers! Well, what would you have? Foreigners have their libraries at home, and the first essential for laboring people is that they should be educated. I repeat to you, the love of reading runs in Icelandic blood. In 1816 we founded a prosperous literary society. Learned strangers think themselves honored in becoming members of it. It publishes books which educate our fellow countrymen, and do the country great service. If you will consent to be a corresponding member, Herr Liedenbrock, you will be giving us a great pleasure. My uncle, who had already joined about a hundred learned societies, accepted with a grace which evidently touched Mr. Friedrichsen. Now, said he, will you be kind enough to tell me what books you hope to find in our library, and I may perhaps enable you to consult them. My uncle's eyes and mine met. He hesitated. This direct question went to the root of the matter, but after a moment's reflection he decided on speaking. Monsieur Friedrichsen, I wish to know if amongst your ancient books you possessed any of the works of Arne Sacknusium. Arne Sacknusium, replied the Rejkjavik professor. You mean that learned sixteenth-century savant, a naturalist, a chemist, and a traveller? Just so. One of the glories of Icelandic literature and science? That's the man. An illustrious man anywhere. Quite so. And whose courage was equal to his genius? I see that you know him well. My uncle was bathed in delight at hearing his hero thus described. He feasted his eyes upon Mr. Fridrikson's face. "'Well,' he cried, "'where are his works?' "'His works? We have them not.' "'What? Not in Iceland?' "'They are neither in Iceland nor anywhere else.' "'Why is that?' "'Because Arne Sacknusum was persecuted for heresy, "'and in 1573 his books were burned by the hands of the common hangman.' "'Very good! Excellent!' cried my uncle, to the great scandal of the professor of natural history. "'What?' he cried. "'Yes, yes. Now it is all clear. Now it is all unravelled. And I see why Sacknusum, put into the index expurgatorius, and compelled to hide the discoveries made by his genius, was obliged to bury in an incomprehensible cryptogram the secret—' "'What secret?' asked Mr. Fridrikson, starting. Oh, just a secret which b my uncle stammered. Have you some private document in your possession? asked our host. No, I was only supposing a case. 
oh, very well, answered Mr. Fridrickson, who was kind enough not to pursue the subject when he had noticed the embarrassment of his friend. I hope you will not leave our island until you have seen some of its mineralogical wealth. Certainly, replied my uncle, but I am rather late, or have not others been here before me? Yes, Herr Liedenbrock. The labors of Misters Olafsen and Povelsen, pursued by order of the king, the researches of Troil, the scientific mission of Mr. Gamard and Robert on the French corvette, La Recherche, and lately the observations of scientific men who came in the Reine Hortense, have added materially to our knowledge of Iceland. But I assure you there is plenty left. Begin note. Recherche was sent out in 1835 by Admiral Dupère to learn the fate of the lost expedition of Monsieur de Blosseville in the Lilloise, which has never been heard of. End note. Do you think so? said my uncle, pretending to look very modest, and trying to hide the curiosity was flashing out of his eyes. Oh, yes! How many mountains, glaciers, and volcanoes there are to study, which are as yet but imperfectly known! Then, without going any further, that mountain in the horizon, that is Snaefell. Ah, said my uncle, as coolly as he was able, is that Snaefell? Yes, one of the most curious volcanoes, and the crater of which has scarcely ever been visited. Is it extinct? Oh, yes, more than five hundred years. Well, replied my uncle, who was frantically locking his legs together to keep himself from jumping up in the air, that is where I mean to begin my geological studies, there on that cephal, uh, f fessel, what do you call it? Snaffle, replied the excellent Mr. Fridrickson. This part of the conversation was in Latin. I had understood every word of it, and I could hardly conceal my amusement at seeing my uncle trying to keep down the excitement and satisfaction which were brimming over in every limb and every feature. He tried hard to put on an innocent little expression of simplicity, but it looked like a diabolical grin. Yes, said he, your words decide me. We will try to scale that snaffle. Perhaps even we may pursue our studies in its crater. I am very sorry, said Mr. Fridrickson, that my engagements will not allow me to absent myself, or I would have accompanied you myself with both pleasure and profit. Oh, no, no, replied my uncle with great animation. We would not disturb any one for the world, Mr. Fridrickson. Still, I thank you with all my heart. The company of such a talented man would have been very serviceable, but the duties of your profession. I am glad to think that our host, in the innocence of his Icelandic soul, was blind to the transparent artifices of my uncle. I very much approve of your beginning with that volcano, Mr. Liedenbrock. You will gather a harvest of interesting observations. But tell me, how do you expect to get to the peninsula of Snaefell? By sea, crossing the bay, that's the most direct way. No doubt, but it is impossible. Why? Because we don't possess a single boat at Rejkjavik. You don't mean to say so. You will have to go by land, following the shore. It will be longer, but more interesting. Very well, then, and now I shall have to see about a guide. I have one to offer you. A safe, intelligent man. Yes, an inhabitant of that peninsula. He is an eater-down hunter, and very clever. He speaks Danish perfectly. When can I see him? Tomorrow, if you like. Why not today? Because he won't be here till tomorrow. Tomorrow, then, added my uncle with a sigh. This momentous conversation ended in a few minutes with warm acknowledgments paid by the German to the Icelandic professor. At this dinner my uncle had just elicited important facts, amongst others the history of Saknusum, the reason of the mysterious document, that his host would not accompany him in his expedition, and that the very next day a guide would be waiting upon him. End of chapter 10